Hi friends, welcome back to the Accent Designer. I'm Simon Gazelle, and in today's video I'm going to be sharing with you guys one of the approaches you can use to write your case study. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Alright, so in the beginning I just want to make it clear for you guys that there is no one way to write your case study but what i meant here in this intro is what i'm about to show you today is what worked for me and worked very well for my students so over the years i've seen a lot of case studies um, people are trying to come up with all different ways to uh, creative ways to write their case studies uh, in animations interactions you know uh, a lot of beautiful visuals so it really depends on your style as a designer and also mostly depends on the projects you worked on. So keep that in mind. All right, so in today's video, I'm gonna be talking about five or six important aspects um, that you have to consider when writing a case study and you have to train yourself and practice to better up your performance um, and make your case studies more engaging with the readers. Keep in mind that anyone who comes across your case study, um, they are not necessarily designers, right? So sometimes it's just people interested in tech, sometimes it's recruiters. So you're trying to make sure the case studies are interesting, provides a lot of value and information, but not too formal because you want to make sure that people won't drop out halfway through the case study. So as you guys can see here, this is a case study of one of my past students. Her name is Karen. Um, she was in my class almost two years ago, 2019. And uh, there's just a couple things that I would like to emphasize in this case study. Um, there are just a lot of good things about her case study, to be completely honest, uh, a lot of pros, and also some things that I believe can be done better uh, if we're trying to get into this headspace of nitpicking on. So the first thing that we can see here is uh, the cover photo. Uh, the cover photo um, is basically a snapshot of all the mediums uh, Karen was designing for. So her project was responsive, creating a responsive dashboard for web, tablet, and mobile. And I guess having this case study um, is a good trigger to make you think whether the designs were intentionally built for all these mediums or that's just another mock-up. So in my opinion, that's a good way to, one of the good ways to start a case study, just to trigger this kind of brain muscle and make you think from the get-go. Followed by the name of the project, of course, and uh, a quick intro to the problem statements or the problem space. Uh, here, one of the things that I personally like about what Karen did with this case study is that she tried to use different words and different phrasing to just any uh, to, to the typical generic words, like for example, the problem space, the intro, challenge, uh, solution. You know, these kind of uh, titles and naming convention um, don't really work that much these days because it sounds or it makes your case study seem more like a checklist, like you're just trying to uh, make sure you covered all the artifacts in a research process and a design process. Um, and quite frankly, it gets really boring because try to put yourself in the recruiters or the design manager's shoes. Uh, they read through hundreds of case studies every time they post for a new role or a new opening and just going through the same case study and the same styling over and over and over, it's such a turn off, right? So one of the things that I like about what Karen did here in this case study, um, and we will see more examples of that later on, is that she was trying to phrase things the same way she would probably have a conversation with a, um, a fellow designer or a stakeholder, right? And that's evidently the way you want to, um, um, or one of the ways you want to keep in your case study just to make it more engaging and more interesting. Followed by some numerical facts uh, and numbers that she collected in her secondary research. Uh, one of the things I would encourage you guys to add in here, if you came across any uh, similar practice, if you came across like, let's say, article or other case studies that tackle the same problem space and provided some facts, having a little bit of citation in the bottom would definitely help. Again, this is not an academic paper, don't get, don't get me wrong, but having a little bit of citation would A, authenticate the findings even better, B, provide more context to the readers if they want to check this resource. After that, we have the uh, epoch, like a quick intro of uh, the company she was designing for, uh, project scope, 
her role and the project timeline, which is uh, three weeks. And this is a very typical, uh, um, I would say, agency like or startup design sprint, three weeks, anywhere between three to uh, four or five weeks. Then uh, a little bit of uh, generic titles and naming conventions, uh, the challenge and the approach. But in this case, I guess it's fine because she already had a very intriguing uh, intro in the beginning. So having a little bit of that here wouldn't really harm um, as opposed to starting off the case study by these two uh, sections. Then we have this neatly designed uh, timeline of how she approached this project and the relationship with the stakeholders or the product owners, followed by another uh, cover photo uh, to fill in this um, empty space and just add a little bit of visuals. In my opinion, one of the things you can do here is associate this cover photo with probably this written section below. Um, for some reason, and again, it, it really depends on the style of just like uh, the people reading through the case study. But from what I saw, like being, being in the position I am, working with design managers and working with a lot of stakeholders, having like a lot of empty space like that um, isn't really encouraged because again, people go through, by people I mean recruiters and HR managers, like design managers, I apologize, they go through uh, just an ample number of case studies every single day. So um, having this, it's, it's just a little bit risky uh, and not a lot of people will enjoy it. Then learning from industry professionals, again, um, along with the style we had in the beginning here, like the way she framed or phrased the intro, uh, same thing. Instead of writing something like research, just to indicate what kind of research or design artifact she's working on, she used simpler and more engaging language, learning from the industry professionals. It's very simple, um, it, it provides much more context and keep me in the loop as a reader. Then we have a little bit of uh, bullet points here to highlight um, the insights she collected from the industry professionals, then a breakdown of another research artifact, which is um, qualitative research, in-person interviews. Then right up front, uh, she started off the section um, with these key insights. And in my opinion, that's just one of the best ways you can do. Don't hide the insights all the way to the end, thinking that you're making things uh, or trying to make it more interesting. It is not. And a lot of people, uh, quite frankly, just scan or skim through the case study looking for these things. And if they couldn't find it easily, um, they just like, they shut it down and uh, start reading something else. And after these insights, uh, we have a quick summary of the competitive and competitive analysis. We have a nice table of all the projects or all the uh, products out there um, that she deems competition to EPOC. Then after that, so now we have a very nice flow. We have the intro of the overarching problem space. We have an intro of um, the specific company she works for. Then we have the project goal followed by a quick and brief, very concise breakdown of the research process and the key findings. Then she compiled everything into the persona. In my opinion, personas, as uh, redundant they might seem for a lot of people, uh, if you manage to use personas in the right way, in my opinion, one of the best artifacts to compile all, all your research findings into uh, a very concise artifact for, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, you can emphasize things like motivations and pain points in personas. Number two, you can frame or put your personas in a really organized order. So each persona refers or indicate one of the dominant themes and patterns you came across uh, in your research. And it helps everyone, especially those non-designers, to follow up with the concept and the scope of your project without having to scroll back and forth or um, pause for a second and remember what you did in the beginning, so on and so forth. So in my opinion, personas uh, play a very important role in this fashion. And uh, that's the reason why I encourage uh, people, I personally use personas and encourage students to use personas in a very, very effective way. Then the following section is 
after compiling all the research artifacts and the insights um, this is a very good time to dive into the design the actual design artifacts building the color palette the mood board trying to create the overall look and feel of the product so we have here a quick uh, style tile uh, we have um, iconography color palettes accent colors typographic scale and the most dominant uh, elements like buttons and call to actions and the different states for each one then here we have uh, some screenshots of the low fidelity and wireframing um, she did for this project and we're gonna pause here for a second i don't know to be completely honest with you guys i'm not sure about showing this much wireframes in a small medium uh, I don't, as a reader, and I'm not talking about having a design critique with other design, like live design critique session with other designers, I'm talking from a reading perspective. I doubt this will provide any value for the readers. Uh, first of all, I can't really zoom in. Even if I tried, I can't really see because things get really pixelated. Um, screenshot of what you did in the wall is looks nice for decorative purposes, just if you're trying to make uh, your case study uh, look more visually appealing and interesting as opposed to having it wordy but it doesn't content wise it doesn't provide any additional value so keep that in mind guys what visuals you want to keep in your case study to supplement your text and make the overall approach to your case study more engaging and interesting uh, so instead of using these screenshots I would highly encourage using things like GIFs um, it's like even teasing the readers uh, much better to continue reading and look for the final result, the final product. So I can say something like high fidelity screenshots of the finalized screens, but I would even urge you to go the extra mile and have some GIFs and prototypes across the whole case study. Then the moment of truth. I really like this title over here. Uh, it's very engaging. It sounds a little bit dramatic, but really engaging. And that's what we're looking for. Uh, then we have a couple of uh, bullet points here um, to indicate what things she was trying to emphasize in the testing sessions. Testing, in my opinion, one of the most, if not the most important artifact in a case study because it showcases what you did, your reasoning, and how you altered uh, your doings based off of the testing sessions you had with the participants. And she did a pretty good job here, well put together screenshots of her designs and very clear annotations of the things she was discussing with the participants, then how she adjusted these designs based on the feedback she got from um, the participants. That was really well done. Uh, testing continues. Then we have a little bit of GIFs here associated with call to actions, view desktop prototype in order to, um, for me as a reader or a design manager, if I'm interested enough to go and check the final product, how it looks like, how it works, etc., etc. et cetera. Uh, so as you guys can see, we have a little bit of GIFs here for the main medium um, in which the product has been designed for and also for the responsive version, the mobile version of this product. Uh, same thing, we have a call to action to check the prototype for this mobile uh, version of the product, which is really nice. I would have highly encouraged Karen to use more of these, uh, more GIFs and more uh, high fidelity screenshots across the whole case study and not just saving it to the end. Uh, then we have the end. One of the nicest uh, things that she, uh, Karen did with this case study is that she had a very engaging end associated with some future considerations, no matter how efficient or how professional of a designer you are. I mean, sometimes, unless we're talking about a, a very small project and a very small company, oftentimes uh, you won't end or finish everything you had in consideration. There will always be some outstanding features and outstanding um, uh, things to be done uh, that you couldn't accomplish during the, uh, uh, the given timeline in the beginning. So one of the best ways to do that is to include a future consideration segment at the end of the case study in order to provide uh, the context and the scope of this project to the fullest. And that's pretty much about it. Um, that's uh, just a very quick and good example of um, a, a real case study. And that was an actual company, uh, not just a hypothetical project, all the pros and cons that I've seen in this one and the things I wanted to emphasize and share with you guys. So to wrap up, we need to be very considerate and emphasize um, the following points when writing the next case study. Number one, the intro. 
Two, the flow. Everything has to connect to one another. I don't want to read one segment in a case study and uh, it's a very well written segment, but doesn't really connect to uh, the other portions above and below. Number three, visuals. Visuals must be interesting, add up to the contents and encourage me to continue reading. Number four, uh, the overall presentation of your findings, how concise your findings are and how well phrased um, and engaging uh, your overall writing style is. So try to keep things, try to keep a good balance between casual, like how you would describe your work to me in person and um, certain level of formality just to keep the content well organized in a written format. Hope you guys enjoyed this quick video. I tried to make it concise and informative as much as possible. If you have any comments or ideas, please leave a comment down below. Thank you very much for tuning in and see you next time.